All right. Well, welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. Um, my name is Katie Estrada, and I am the Executive Director of Classy. And we're so excited to have you all here and to have Dr. Melissa Kay with us um, to facilitate this wonderful webinar. Um, we've been lucky enough to have her for several sessions. And um, this uh, session is going to take a closer look at ASI research. Um, I would like to share with everyone before we get started quickly, we have some great U.S. dates coming up for the Classy Certificate in ASI program. We're offering courses in California, Ohio, and New York. Um, if you'd like to learn more information about those courses, I encourage you to please visit us at cl-asi.org. Uh, there's more information on the full program about all of the different locations and, and courses, both internationally and here in the United States. Um, so please, we hope to welcome you to a course soon. There's still time to join these U.S. states uh, that are coming up in June, and we would love to have uh, your participation. And with that, let me get Melissa's slides back up here. And... Great. And Melissa, Dr. Melissa Kay has been an OT for 21 years. She is the founder and director of Firefly Center Therapy Services for Children in the San Francisco Bay Area. She is also a university instructor and currently teaches at Samuel Merritt University in Oakland, California in the Occupational Therapy Department and at the University of San Francisco in the Educational Technology Department. And we are delighted to have Melissa here. So I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to you, Melissa. And thank you so much for joining everyone. Great. Thank you, Katie. Well, welcome, everyone. Uh, we're glad you're here. Uh, for those of you that are joining us for the first time, uh, we've been taking a look uh, last month and this month at research in air sensory integration. Last month what we did was looked at a systematic review and this month we're going to take a little deeper dive into research. So how the sessions typically work is that uh, I talk for about 20-25 minutes and then we leave the rest of the time for questions. So if you'll hold your questions until the end that would be great. Please uh, jot them down so that you can remember what you'd like to ask and uh, we will go ahead and get started. All right, so this month we are looking at an article, a uh, research study by Schaaf, Benavides, Melo, Fowler, Hunt, Van Huydonk, Freeman, Levy, Sandecki, and Kelly. And uh, the name of the article is An Intervention for Sensory Difficulties in Children with Autism, a Randomized Trial. It's from the Journal of Autism and Developmental Disorders in 2013. And uh, I will link the slide deck uh, to Katie, and it's got the full citation. It also came out in print in 2014, so you should be able to access that. And I just uh, found my first typo. Um, no presentation is ever perfect. Schaaf is S-C-H-A-A-F, so my apologies to Roseanne. All right, so that is a super long name. Um, and let's take a little deeper dive and look at, at really what that means. So here is the title. Uh, the research article is An Intervention for Sensory Difficulties in Children with Autism, a Randomized Trial. So we're going to unpack that a little bit. Uh, an intervention for sensory difficulties. So when we think about sensory difficulties, we might be thinking about praxis difficulties. We might be thinking about reactivity difficulties. And in this case, the children that were in the study actually experienced, in many cases, both of those, um, and in some cases, one or the other. What we know about research and, you know, to just um, kind of ad address the, the issue that comes up over and over again in sensory integration, um, does it work, you know, and, and do, we have, um, do we have proof that sensory integration works? Well, um, in the past, there has been 
uh, a fair amount of research, but the research did not very precisely or very in a, in a uh, super highly organized fashion look at intervention for uh, children with sensory difficulties. And so what we're seeing now and over the past probably 10 to 15 years is that occupational therapists and others who practice sensory integration are becoming better researchers. And what that means is that we're becoming more careful, more structured, um, more systematic in our efforts to look at the needs of the children that we work with. In this case, one piece of that is that it's not only an article and a research study about uh, children with sensory difficulties, but also children with autism who have sensory difficulties. And by being very specific about the population that we are studying, we can actually get better results and, and um, uh, stronger results than we could if we just looked at kids. And we'll be talking more about the sample that was used in this study. But for now, it's important that you keep in mind um, because you too could be the next generation or the current generation of researchers in sensory integration, that the more specific and the more particular we are, the better. So we're going to be looking at a study that centers on children with autism who also have sensory difficulties. And this study is a randomized trial. So what does that mean? When we create evidence, in other words, do research, um, there are a number of different levels of research that we can do. And they're, and they're rated, pretty much. Um, hey, Katie, you know what? Uh, I, don't have, um, I don't have the ability to, uh, to have, uh, here we go. Excuse me for one sec, guys. We had a little trouble uploading the, um, the slide deck. OK, uh, so now I have my notes. So a randomized contro control trial, also known as an RCT, randomized control trial, is uh, what is known as the gold standard of research. And that's why there's that little gold star up at the top. What this means is that when we do a randomized control trial, we take a group of participants, in this case children who have autism and also sensory problems, and we randomly assign them to either the group that's going to get the intervention, which in this case is sensory integration therapy, or the control group. So the power of the randomized control trial, and I know this is kind of geeky and, and, um, and statistical and so on, but in consuming research and potentially conducting research, it's important to understand that when we have a group, say uh, we have a group of 100 people, and we randomly, um, and the easiest way to randomize would be to pick names out of a hat or numbers out of a hat, and um, by luck of the draw, 50 people go into group A and 50 people go into group B. What that does and why it's important is that the groups are, um, by virtue of the fact that they're randomly constructed, are considered to be equivalent to each other. In other words, there might be some kids who are super high functioning, some kids who are super low functioning, some kids that their, um, their main issue is praxis, other kids whose main issue is sensory reactivity in group A. And what we would expect, just by probability of, of um, assigning the kids randomly, is that group B would have a very similar makeup. So it gets more complicated than that. But for our purposes, what we really want to see when we're looking at um, research is what kind of study it is. And a randomized control trial uh, is kind of the, the most um, stringent or uh, highest level of evidence that we can get. Because it, the bias that gets created, you know, like say we're, say we're doing a study 
and it's just kids from our practice, right? And uh, say I have 20 kids and I'm going to assign 10 to, to uh, one intervention and 10 to another. Well, it's very hard for me to assign them uh, randomly and that means that, um, that my groups are kind of biased. They might not be equal. And if the groups are not equal, when I do an intervention with them, it's going to affect those groups differently. So that's what uh, randomization is about. And hopefully that, uh, that made some pretty good sense. The next level of evidence, and we won't uh, spend a lot of time on this, is something called a cohort study. And a cohort study um, is when uh, people are followed over a period of time. So we look at a group of people over a period of time and we take, uh, we collect data on them uh, at various points in time while they're a part of a study. So in this case, the fact that we're observing people uh, or working with people over a long period of time means that the evidence that we get is of high quality. Underneath that is a cross-sectional case study. And uh, cross-sectional uh, is, a, is a little bit less rigorous. And it basically um, means that we, um, uh, we look at a portion of the population. And we may, in fact, um, switch, uh, give group A sensory integration in part of the study, and then give group B sensory integration in part of the study so that we can observe its effect on all the, all the participants of the study. Um, case control is uh, basically uh, what it sounds like, that it's, um, that it's single cases. And this isn't bad in any way. It's just not as strong as having a large group of participants. And finally, a case series, which is primarily what we can do in, uh, in clinical practice. We can carefully observe and document the kids that we're seeing and then put together a number of cases, in other words, a series, so that um, we can get an idea of um, what a particular intervention is doing for a particular set of individuals. All right, so um, you've made it to the end of the uh, research design portion of our, of our slideshow. And we're going to go on and talk about um, what the Schaaf study was about. The study had two purposes. The, the first, the primary purpose, was to evaluate the efficacy of OT slash SI following a manualized protocol on individual goal attainment this is the primary outcome, in comparison to usual care. So what this means is that it's a sensory integration that has been um, really very carefully planned in an actual manual so that all of the therapists who were uh, treating the children did the same thing. That doesn't mean that everybody got exactly the same activities at the same time, because we know that that is not at the core of sensory integration. But what it means is that, uh, that the treatment was um, structured in such a way that everybody had kind of the same concept of what was going to happen and what constituted sensory integration with an OT perspective. We're going to talk about goal attainment in just a minute. And the other thing that's important for you to know is that it's in comparison to something called usual care. And this study uh, defined usual care as whatever services the child was getting. They remained on whatever medications that they were taking, but they didn't change any services over the course of the study and they also didn't add any, um, any medication or any other prescription drugs over the course of the study. So that was the primary purpose, to see if OTSI was efficacious. The secondary purpose was to evaluate the impact of this approach on the child's sensory behaviors, adaptive behaviors, and functional skills. So, the primary purpose was looking at goal attainment, in other words, meeting goals. 
And then they also looked at sensory behaviors, adaptive behaviors, and functional skills. Okay. The participants in the group were 32 children. They were aged 4 to 11, 7 years, 11 months. They all had a history of uh, a diagnosis of autism. And this was made by a licensed psychologist and was based on uh, the autism diagnostic interview and also the autism diagnostic observation schedule. So it was very specific. It wasn't just like somebody said, yeah, I think they have autism. It was a hard, fast diagnosis. And that was needed um, to include the kids in the study. Now, they also had to have a nonverbal IQ of 65 or greater, so nobody could, be, um, nobody could have serious cognitive impairments, and they had to have documented sensory processing difficulties. And the way that that was measured was through the sensory profile, and they had to have um, scores that were outside of the norm on three or more subscales. They were also given the SIFT, and they had to be more than one standard deviation on three or more subtests. So the criteria for including children was very specific. And again, it's important to get specific, because when you think about it, um, those of us that look, uh, and work with, look at and work with kids with autism, um, they look really, really different. And so what the researchers wanted to do is get a sample that was as like as possible. OK, so the treatment was manualized OTSI intervention. How the researchers defined that was that it followed Ayer's principles of sensory integration, her theory, how she set up environments, how she conducted therapy. Um, all of Ayer's tenets were followed. There was a treatment manual, and that enabled the treatment to be manualized. In other words, there was a written document that described what SI, OTSI treatment looked like. There was fidelity, which we'll discuss a little bit more in a minute. It followed um, the DDDM process, which is the data-driven decision-making process, uh, which was developed by uh, Roseanne Schaff. And it helps to, again, kind of standardize care. So it's a process that we follow from the time a child gets referred through evaluation, through report writing, into treatment planning and treatment, and then follows progress. It was also, in keeping with Ayer's philosophy, individually tailored. So again, you know, it wasn't like every kid who came in got um, you know, first they got swung for 10 minutes, and then they uh, crawled through tunnels for five minutes. It was not like that. There was no cookbook approach. It was individually tailored. And these children um, were provided with three times a week treatment for 10 weeks. So they received three hours a week on three different days for 10 weeks, or a total of 30 OTSI sessions. And again, usual care was that the child uh, kept getting whatever they were already receiving in services. OK, so we talked about randomization a bit. Um, what the researchers wanted to do is to randomize based on uh, the severity of the autism and also on the cognitive level. So they wanted to do kind of a uh, a two-step process, that they would divide the kids based on these criteria, and then they would randomize them from those subgroups. What happened, however, is that since there was only a small sample in the study, just over 30 participants, they didn't have enough participants to do that, uh, that stratification. So it was simply a randomized, um, ra two randomized groups, and it helped to ensure that the results from the study were not due to the bias of who was in which group. Going back to fidelity, we have a measure called the fidelity measure, which was authored by Parham et al. in 2011. 
and I believe that we're going to look at that next month. So stay tuned for more on that. In a nutshell, what the fidelity measure does is it looks at the process and also the content of therapy so that uh, we can ascertain whether a therapist is actually doing ASI or if they're doing something else. And what we know is that there's a lot of other things that therapists do. Some therapists do a little bit of uh, sensory motor work. They might work on one sensory system. They might have passive sensory experiences like having a weighted blanket or sitting on a seat cushion or um, having a chewy toy. There's a lot of other things that therapists do that has kind of fallen under the umbrella of quote unquote sensory integration. And in differentiating air sensory integration from everything else, the fidelity measure was developed and it is a checklist that has a number of different um, areas, a whole bunch of areas, that look at the equipment in a gym, they look at the therapist's um, training and behavior, they look at what happens during a therapy session, and it helps us to determine what is ASI versus what is not ASI. And again, when we're doing an intervention study, we want to be really sure that the intervention is what we say it is. I know that sounds very common sense, but in the past, it has not always been that what was called sensory integration actually was in keeping with AIR's philosophy and approach to intervention. All right, so in addition, um, the fidelity checks there was monitoring and improving provider service provision through the fidelity and it also helped ensure external validity. In other words, what I was just talking about that we actually were doing what we said we were going to do and it was faithful to AIR's sensory integration intervention. If you remember, the first, the primary purpose of this study was to use OTSI for goal attainment. So goal attainment is a particular kind of outcome measure that captures functional outcomes in children. It is a systematic identification of goals that's often done in collaboration with families and the OT and in some cases the, the child or adolescent themselves. It's useful for individuals with autism because it enables us to individualize outcomes for a particular person and in contrast with a standardized test where if the, if the child fails an item on a test then their score goes down, right? But we didn't choose that particular item on the test. The test just comes with a number of items. And when put together, we say that that test measures, for example, uh, fine motor skill or gross motor skill or sensory processing. So goal attainment is a way of really individualizing outcomes based on the child's particular needs. It has been in use, mm, I want to say, since like the 70s. And it's been found in various instances with various populations to be both valid and reliable. So here's a sample goal for goal attainment scaling. And we won't spend a lot of time on this, but I'll point out some of the high points. So at the top, the goal is to decrease sensory sensitivity in the oral area as a basis for toothbrushing. So toothbrushing is the outcome that we're looking for. But first, we have to decrease uh, oral sensory sensitivity. Then we list the current performance. It takes 20 to 30 minutes for toothbrushing with assistance from mother. Um, and the child, JH, uh, has some reactions to that, and it's very unpleasant. So goal attainment scale, scaling then um, sets up uh, a zero, which you can see in the middle of that bottom left-hand section, which is if they get a zero, 
they will have reached the expected level of attainment. And if you look across to the right, the, the criteria is that they will brush their teeth within a 9 to 12 minute time frame, right? So now it takes 20 to 30 minutes. We want to reduce it to 9 to 12 minutes. You'll also see that there's a minus 1 and a minus 2 and a plus 1 and a plus 2. So what we're doing in goal attainment scaling is we're identifying and defining what each level of performance will be. So it's a very powerful tool for measuring individual goals in a particular child. Again, the intervention was, uh, was primarily conducted, I think 100% conducted, uh, in New Jersey, in the US, and at a particular site. And a number of therapists, who happen to all be authors of the article, participated in the study and did this three days a week for one hour per session over 10 weeks for a total of 30 sessions for each children, each child. And the results of the goal attainment scaling were gathered via independent samples t-test. And what that is is a statistical test that looks at two groups, in this case, the intervention group versus the control group. And it answers the question, is there a statistically significant difference between those two groups at the time of uh, when the goal attainment scaling was measured. So when those uh, children's individual goals were um, reviewed and scored. What they found is that the OT-SI group had significantly higher scores than the control group. So in effect, it's saying that OT-SI works better than usual care on goal attainment scaling. Here's another look at the, goal, the type of goals that were used in the study. So you can see up at the top, and, and we won't spend a lot of time on this, but up at the top are self-care goals, then play goals, uh, sitting, daily routine participation, fine motor, meal participation, community participation, communication, and then a number of other areas that had less, um, less emphasis in the study. So the F stands for the frequency of goal type. Um, and then we look and we see the self-care group had uh, 27 of those goals versus the usual care had 25. So, so pretty even. Um, and in this study, each child had five goals that were measured with goal attainment scaling. So they might have had two self-care goals, or they might have had you know, no um, sleep goals, but a fine motor goal. So they were all mixed up, but everybody had five goals. If you'll recall, this study also looked at functional behaviors of children with autism. And what the researchers found is that the children in the OTSI group improved more than those in the control group on two measures um, that were used from the Pediatric Evaluation of Disability Inventory, which is also referred to as the PD. So the subtest where they had really strong showings was self-care with caregiver assistance and social function with caregiver assistance. And in this case, what happened was that the participants required less caregiver assistance after the intervention than before. And those in the usual care group did not present with that finding. For those of you that are interested in the statistics, they used a test called the Wilcoxon Rank Sum Test. It's also sometimes referred to as the Mann-Whitney U test. And it's a non-parametric test, which means it's not the absolute strongest test, and that's Typically, when we use that, it's typically because our sample is small 
and we don't have enough strength or enough power of the sample to conduct, um, to run a stronger, a stronger test. Nevertheless, it is a, uh, you know, reasonably respected and efficacious statistical measure of this area of, uh, of improvement functional behaviors. Okay, there was two other areas that were investigated in the, uh, in the secondary purpose of the study. The first was uh, ASD behaviors, in other words, autism spectrum disorder behaviors, and we can think of that as um, things that reflect the qualities and the criteria of autism, repetitive um, motions or behaviors, um, the tendency to look out of the corner of the eye, uh, very narrow areas of focus, lack of social reciprocity, decreased eye contact, those sorts of things that we associate with children with autism. And then adaptive behaviors, which, wa which were uh, measured with the Vineland. So adaptive behaviors being those kind of soft skills that enable a child to be functional and productive in their environment and in their daily life. And what they found in both those areas, the ASD behaviors and the adaptive behaviors, is that there was no significant differences between the two groups, between the OTSI group and the control group. And again, they ran the same Wilcoxon rank sum test. So this did not show improvement as a result of the OTSI intervention. Any time that we uh, conduct a research study, we have the results and then we have a discussion section. And the discussion, you know, the results are what happened and the discussion is why is it important. So for clinicians, the discussion can be a powerful place to look. In this case, the discussion uh, in Schaff et al. said that uh, this study was one of the only randomized controlled trials that has been done with OTSI. So for that reason alone, it is a powerful piece. Also, the OT group improved more than the control on the goal attainment scaling with a Cohen's D, which is an effect size of 1.2. And what that means is how important are the results? And a 1.2 is a large effect. So the results are important. They're practically important to clinicians, to um, students, to the families. They actually are not only statistically significant, but they're important to us. We also know that the OTSI group needed less caregiver assistance than the control group after the treatment, which is really important. You know, it's not, it's not necessarily that we're expecting that these kids improve on everything and be independent on everything, but in some cases what we're looking for is that they're a little bit more independent and so they require less caregiver assistance. The study also you know, presents a structure that provides a model for future research and treatment. The researchers ask the question, what caused the positive findings? And what they came up with is that the children had both sensory modulation and praxis issues, and the gains that they made were reflected initially in modulation and praxis, but then they were reflected in self-care and social participation and skill. So the sensory integration is, is a bottom-up, you know, brainstem mediated kind of intervention that has very far-reaching implications for a child participating in their daily life occupations. So that also is a very powerful finding. It also showed, you know, not beyond a shadow of a doubt, but it definitely showed that neuroplasticity was at work over that period of 10 weeks to change the, the nervous system of the children who are receiving OTSI. The authors also had recommendations for future research. They want 
there to be more studies that replicate the findings that they had, larger sample size, which is definitely indicated. We want to see samples that are, that are greater than, than you know, 30 plus um, children. And again, it's difficult to do that in practice, but that's what we're aiming for. They wanted to include outcomes that relied on direct observations of behavior. So the GAS was um, scored by the parents. You know, did, can your child brush their teeth in less than, you know, 20 to 30 minutes? Well, yes, they can. They went down to 16 minutes. But, you know, what we, what we want to do ultimately is we want to see for ourselves. Parent report or caregiver report is fine, but we want, to, we want to actually make those observations as we move forward with research. We want to supplement parent report with other kinds of measures, have a longer intervention period, and more diversity, um, cultural, age-wise, um, forms of autism, kids without autism. So we want to have more diversity in future samples. That is the sum of this study, and at this point I will be happy to answer questions either about the study or about uh, anything else related to ASI. I may or may not be able to, <laughs> to answer it, but I will give it my best shot. And um, I'm going to put up my contact information, so if you have questions that I don't get to today, or something comes up later, you can feel free to email me at melissak13 at gmail.com. So I thank you for your attention, uh, and uh, the floor is open for discussion. And if you'd like to unmute your mic and actually ask a question, you're welcome to do that too, or you can simply type. I see Sapora is typing. Sephora asks, you touched upon this, but can you be a bit more specific about actual SI treatment that was used? Uh, you know, the original, the original article has a lot more um, about the treatment that was used, and I have that article up, so I can, um, I can tell you about that. Um, can I tell you about that? It doesn't say, actually, Sephora. Uh, it, it talks a lot about the tests that were used to, to measure outcomes and about the inclusion criteria. I think that, you know, the, the fidelity measure was used, and that will be very helpful in... Um, in distinguishing what was done. And if you, if you give me just a second, um, I can pull up the fidelity measure and talk about that. And I'm noticing that, um, that there uh, is some problems with the slides and uh, our apologies for that. Hopefully we will get that straightened out. Okay, so within the fidelity measure, and again, I think that this is going to be the topic for next month, um, there are key elements that are necessary for something to be called air sensory integration as opposed to something else. The, um, the fidelity measure consists of two parts. Um, there is the 
therapist qualifications, well, I'll, I'll read them to you. Um, there's the therapist qualifications, which includes training in SI and supervision, a safe environment, and there are uh, a number of criteria that, um, that actually define what a, what a safe environment is. There's historical information and other assessment reports that are necessary, um, including uh, current information about the child and assessment results. And I realize this is not the intervention yet, but it's a whole process. And so what you're seeing is that the process needs to be followed uh, very particularly. There are specific physical space and equipment requirements. And in physical space, for example, a flexible arrangement of equipment and materials to allow for rapid change of the physical and spatial configuration of intervention environment. No and then another one, no less than three hooks for hanging suspended equipment. Minimal distance between hooks is two and a half to three feet, enough room to allow for full orbit on suspended equipment. Recommend additional hooks depending on size of the room. Uh, one or more rotational devices to allow 360 degrees of rotation, a quiet space, like a tent, uh, one or more set of bungee cords for hanging suspended equipment, and adequate space to allow for the flow of vis vigorous physical activity. So that's just the, um, the physical space aspect of it. So it's very specific, and um, it you know, when, when all of this is taken together, it provides for this idea of um, what the actual SI treatment uh, includes. So there's equipment, there's communication with parents and teachers, and um, then there's process items that look at ensuring physical safety, presenting sensory act opportunities, uh, the therapist supporting sensory modulation for attaining and maintaining a regulated state, challenging postural, ocular, oral, and or bilateral motor control, challenging praxis and organization of behavior, collaborating in activity choice, and that's the, the um, child and the therapist, tailoring activity to present the just right challenge, ensuring that activities are successful, and I could go on, uh, I could go on quite a bit more. But it, as you see, um, what we're, what we're um, looking at is that the tenets or the philosophy or theory of sensory integration, for example, the fact that we're looking for a just right challenge actually gets defined and it gets operationalized, which means that there are certain criteria that make it ASI versus not ASI and those are actually addressed. I hope that helps. Other questions? We have about 15 minutes left. You're very welcome, Sephora. So I don't see anybody typing, and I would encourage you, uh, even if you feel like you, know, you don't have a great question to ask, or it's not the most complicated, or it's not about the article, or if English is not your first language, I would still encourage you to take the opportunity to, um, you know, to ask me questions. And if I can't answer it, there's uh, undoubtedly a number of other people with a wealth of information. So, uh, at this point, you know, we're, we're using this little bit of time just as a, as a way to, um, to collaborate with each other. Looks like I got um, Jan or Jan to, to type. And uh, you don't have to wait to type. Uh, I can see all of the chat, so multiple people can be, can be typing at the same time.
So the question is, thank you so much for presenting this information. Are there any plans for multi-site studies to increase the sample size in the future? My understanding, and, and maybe Sue can ring in on this as well, is that uh, Roseanne Schaff, who's the, the first author of this study, actually uh, is working at, she works at Thomas Jefferson University, and she is a research coordinator in um, research that has to do with children with autism. And so my suspicion is, yes, indeed, there will be um, more studies that encompass multi, multiple sites in the future. You can see, however, that with all the details that need to be covered, that it requires more than kind of a bunch of therapists who happen to work in the same hospital or um, you know, a, a few different clinics where the directors know each other. It really requires some funding and also someone to, uh, to organize and oversee the whole, uh, the whole study. So that's what we're really looking for. And I, it, I don't say this to discourage you from doing clinician research, but more so, um, and if you didn't take anything else from this particular lecture, um, take away that research is tough, right? So it's not necessarily that sensory integration, quote, does not work, close quote, but that it's, it's really difficult to measure. It's difficult to measure children, the behavior of children with autism. It's difficult to operationalize sensory integration and to, um, and to use an individualized treatment on a whole bunch of kids and then measure the results of that treatment. Yeah, you're right. We don't need studies that are not well designed and executed. But I would differentiate um, poor studies from small studies. So, uh, you know, if you, are, um, if you are interested in doing research, I would strongly encourage you to do research, even if you're doing it on one child at a time. If you're, um, you know, if you're disciplined about it and strategic, you can do a series of case studies, and those, and those children, um, you know, each one of those children, when put together, add up to stronger evidence. Um, Kiana asked, how long was the frequency of the intervention given to the population, such as the number of sessions per week or month, and for how long did it occur? So I am going to um, type that and uh, say it. So three times per week one hour sessions each time for 10 weeks. And that totaled 30 sessions. So if you think about it, Kiana, you know, we don't really have a good idea of how much is a good thing for sensory integration. And in the, in the US, we tend to default to one, maybe two sessions per week, unless there's some really outstanding funding, right? So we don't even really know, is 10 weeks with five days a week treatment going to make a huge difference? Um, so, you know, and if we go for 10 weeks, that's 50 sessions. Or do we do once a week for an entire year for 50 sessions? And, and what are the differences between that? So it's, uh, we're so at the beginning of researching sensory integration, even just the most effective prescription, right? So how much therapy is, is the right amount of therapy? You're very welcome. Who else has a question? Well, it doesn't look like anyone is typing. So at this point, I have a question for you, which is, would you like 
for the Oh, no problem, Mikhail. I'll ask my question while you're typing your question, if that's OK. For, uh, what are we in May? Uh, for June, would it be beneficial to dig into the fidelity measure and really look at what constitutes air sensory integration? And if you think that's a good idea, please just um, type uh, yes. And if you have another idea of what you'd like to hear about, um, I would love to hear what you want. So I'm getting some yeses. Thank you so much. And you can add your yes. Um, in the meanwhile, I am going to address Mikhail's question. Uh, can you tell me how we can uh, differentiate an ASI intervention from any other SI intervention? So we used to call this thing that Gene Ayers developed sensory integration. And, uh, and again, you know, I'm in, uh, I'm in San Francisco, California, just to give you my, uh, my kind of perspective on things. And, uh, and so, all we did was sensory integration. We didn't call it air sensory integration. Uh, several years ago, uh, it became clear that a lot of people were doing uh, therapy with children, which used the senses, but did not use the, um, the tools and the principles that Ayers came up with when she was developing actually sensory integration. And so uh, we came up with a different name for it, and that name is actually um, you know, registered and copyrighted, and the name is air sensory integration. So in a lot of cases, and in some places, there's absolutely no difference between SI intervention and ASI intervention. But what we're trying to safeguard against is that um, like again, in California, um, there's a big movement for um, sensory rooms. And so a sensory room is a place that you can go into and you can see fiber optics and you can sit in a beanbag chair and watch a lava lamp and there might be soft music playing and there's different textures on the floor. And um, in some places, I haven't ever experienced this myself, and it sounds a little bit odd to me. There's like um, beds that kids can lie on, and they and they sort of vibrate. Um, so there's a whole bunch of other stuff that people do to activate the senses, but it does it is not sensory integration. Does that make sense to you? And if you could just type a yes or no. That would be awesome. Yes, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, oh, I heard a microphone. Oh, awesome. Hi. Hi, it's nice to hear you. Yeah, so, uh, so there's a lot of things that could be beneficial to kids, but they're not sensory integration. And so we're trying to um, say, we're trying to draw a line that says this is and this is not sensory integration. And by looking at the fidelity measure, I think that um, it will become super clear to you. And everything that's, that's in the ASI fidelity measure used to be regular old SI intervention. But we've, we've made it more specific. Does that help? Yes, yes, of course. Uh, I was saying, uh, in matter of fact, here uh, in Portugal, we learn in, the, in college that uh, uh, that kind of room, we call it your snoozeland. Uh, room, and it's more for sensory mm -hmm. stimulation than sensory integration. That's the difference we. Absolutely, yeah. We call it snoozeland too. Yeah, yeah. You know, and there's a lot of school-based therapists that um, that do like a sensory approach to handwriting. So they'll have kids um, practice their letters in shaving cream, or they'll. Um, have bumpy paper that, that gives some tactile feedback, or they'll have a kid sit on a ball and get some uh, proprioceptive and vestibular input while they're at a table writing. And, and it's not to say that those things are not good or effective, 
but they're not sensory exactly. integration. Exactly, that's that's exactly how we learned. Um, we learned this, the sensory integration method. Um, our teachers always told uh -huh. us that the, at least uh, the way I understand it, that uh, when you talk about sensory integration, the children must seek for the the sensations. They must seek for for it. Which we, we should not provide them the the sensation. They have to go looking for it. And if we provide them the the, right. the sensation and the stimuli is more uh, sensory stimulation uh, than sensory integration. Absolutely, yeah. So one of the defining features of sensory integration is that it's active on the part of the exactly. child. Yeah. So maybe what we'll do next uh, next month is um, is look at what are the basic principles of sensory integration, and then how does the fidelity measure work? Okay. Okay. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much. I see uh, Tina is typing, and we have about um, three or four minutes left. So um, let's get her question, and uh, and then we'll probably wrap it up for the evening. Okay, so Tina says, I think it would be of great benefit to do sensory integration versus sensory stimulation presentation. And also, if you could add a part about how one could take a sensory stimulation treatment session and turn it into a sensory integration session, i.e., the handwriting and shaving cream. Um, you know what, um, Tina? I am going to copy and um, paste that and see what I can make of it. I think that um, I think I might be inclined to say uh, this is sensory integration and everything else isn't. Um, but uh, yeah, and we'll look at. Um, I, I think it's a great idea about how could we turn something into something else. And maybe what we'll do is ha is have a case study at the end where. Um, we see, can we turn a shaving cream handwriting session into a sensory integration session based on what we know about fidelity to ASI? So awesome idea. Thank you so much. Ah, okay. Instead of using shaving cream, you can get the same results by swinging. Um, yeah, I think we're working on different goals, uh, potentially, if we're doing shaving cream to do letters versus shaving cream to have um, regulating tactile input. Um, so we'll also um, likely talk about Talk about the types of goals that we think of when we think about sensory integration. Um, because by and large, we don't, we don't want to write goals that are like um, the child will tolerate 15 minutes of swinging. What we want to do is we want to use the vestibular input to then get an adaptive response. And the adaptive response um, tends to be in an area of occupation. Okay. Well, I thank you so much for your kind attention. Like I said, if you have any questions um, or anything that, that comes up, I would be more than happy to hear from you. And uh, it's been a pleasure to meet with you tonight. And we will have our next session um, on the third Wednesday in June. And I can tell you what that date is in just a moment. Um, June 19th. Thank you so much. Thank everyone. you, Melissa. And like I said, we'll be uh, sending out a link to a recording of this session. So in case you missed anything or would like to share it, 
uh, stay tuned to your uh, email coming in. Thanks again, everyone, and have a good evening. Or